This is a production of Cornell University. Hear me. Thanks, Lynn, for that, for that wonderful introduction and for uh, decades of, of friendship and professional collaboration. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to share uh, our research program at the Danforth Center uh, with, with, with Cornell and everyone who's doing some fantastic plant science here. Um, you might see some familiar, play, uh, some familiar faces, some familiar references to, to Cornell folks. Um, as Lynn said, I'm the director of the X-ray imaging facility at the Danforth Center. Uh, and if you are not already aware, uh, the Danforth Center is the world's largest uh, nonprofit independent plant science uh, research institute. And uh, we have the fortunate position to really look into a lot of issues in plant science, especially food security, that, that other places don't really have the freedom or the support um, to do. Um, I'm a research scientist in Dr. Chris Topp's lab. Chris is the PI and he started the lab in 2013 using phenotyping to look at root biology. And that has expanded to include not only roots and genetics, but everything surrounding the roots. So there's a wide range of expertise that we share. And as I expect many of you here are starting to realize that no one lab will have nearly enough expertise to get everything done. You must collaborate. You must find ways to work with your colleagues to really pull more of the science out of all these projects. So you can see the list on the left, plant genotypes and uh, genetics and phenotyping, my background in microscopy and imaging, there's cell biology, there's ag engineering, chemical engineering, and perhaps most importantly is computational science because all the beautiful images are mostly just greeting cards until we can actually pull some of that biological information back out the other end of these, these really cool 3D volumes. So a couple different um, headings today. Um, this is lab-based X-ray microscopy as opposed to working at a synchrotron. Uh, the lab base makes it very, very accessible. There's, of course, uh, trade-offs compared to synchrotron imaging. Uh, so I'll cover X-ray tomography. Folks often say it's micro CT or nano CT or macro. No, that's just the resolution you're dealing with. It's all the same instrument. So we have an X-ray tomography instrument. We have an X-ray microscope which generates images in a slightly different way. Um, there's specific application in volume electron microscopy. That is using XRM as a roadmap to show you where in your resin block you want to go for organelle level volume imaging with, with a serial block face SEM or, or a FibSEM, other than the, the instrumentation that does uh, tomography at the nanometer scale. Uh, we've done some really sort of exciting pioneering work looking at mycorrhizal fungi in situ, which is a really big challenge. And uh, we've been recently getting into looking at uh, X-ray imaging of field soil to try to see what can we understand about the 3D structure of soil uh, at multiple scales. So to begin with, uh, coming up on eight years this August, we took delivery of a large format industrial scale uh, X-ray tomography instrument. This has been in uh, collaboration with Valent Bioscience, uh, Biosciences, who make a lot of, of biorationals and, and mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal uh, products for the commercial market, in addition to uh, part of an NSF grant. Now, these large-scale industrial instruments are frequently found in automotive and aerospace. Boeing will probably have a dozen of these to look at aircraft parts. They have to do non-destructive imaging of aircraft parts to confirm that they're, they're in good shape. And having taken two different flights to get here, I'm glad they do that. Mm -hmm. They know the parts are working, but they have to certify that all the parts are good. So they have uh, very large cabinets. They can handle very heavy weights. They have a lot of interior space to work with. And these were the advantages that we found uh, in the large format instrument. A, a quick review of how we generate image data using um, X-ray tomography. The setup is relatively straightforward. You have an X-ray source, sample sits on a turntable in the middle, and you have a detector which collects the image. We uh, broadcast X-rays through the sample that impinges on the detector. We'll rotate that turntable over uh, typically 360 degrees. We'll collect thousands of images from around all those angles. 
and then computationally reassemble all those images into a 3D volume that we can now explore electronically. Um, a lot of the animations that you'll see today, uh, certainly the colorful ones were done by my senior technician, uh, Clara Lebo. She's been developing her uh, undergraduate degree in art, her master's degree in electron microscopy and combining them to really make some stunning and striking ways of, of presenting these 3D volumes. The practical offshoot is we can study these things without tearing them apart. If you wanted to count every seed inside this pepper, you could do that digitally without having to hack it apart. Um, some of the very first work we did was uh, actually in collaboration with Jason Londo, who's at uh, Geneva. Uh, hopefully you're online there, Jason, hello. Um, they provided hundreds of, of grape rachises. These are the stems left behind after the berries of the grape are gone. And if you want to improve grape varieties, you can't just focus on making big berries. You need to understand the underlying 3D architecture of what's going to hold those berries and the enormous amount of variability that already exists in these systems. So certainly with our eyes, we can look at all the different grape bunches and see that they're very, very different, but how do we quantify these differences? So what we did is we scanned hundreds of these um, grape rachises, and when you are fortunate enough to work with um, an applied mathematician like Mao Li, who's one, one of her expertise areas is looking at topology. How do you evaluate a 3D structure? And so she uses something called persistent homology, which takes a geodesic distance that you measure from one end of a complicated structure to the other, and the timing at which various components fuse into one another or disappear can be mapped as a barcode. And this animation illustrates as you go from the tips down into the central trunk and down, the various components start to disappear and get melded into one. And these can be portrayed as a barcode. And so what's, what that allows you to do is take many different complicated branching structures and mathematically distinguish them using this barcode sort of architecture. Again, this is Mao's expertise, certainly not mine. So I am exceedingly fortunate to work with such experts. Margaret knows, knows Mao very well also. Um, yes? The bell pepper that you had up there before, uh, assuming that the instrument and everything is all set up, how long does it take for the machine to, to do the scanning to generate the information which then ultimately leads to the video? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how long, specifically that bell pepper scan, how long does it take to image? And for that particular bell pepper, it was about 30 minutes. It's relatively non-dense, relatively easy imaging. So a 30-minute scan, typically 3,600, 4,500 4, projections. We can do it shorter. It will be lower resolution. We can go longer, higher resolution. So there's a window within which we work. But for something low density like that, a 30-minute scan covered that. So jumping it back into persistent homology, it's a way to uh, measure all these unique 3D scans of all these hundreds of, of great uh, rachises that we did. So I provided all the 3D data to Mao. She ran these 3D shapes. We extracted uh, surface volumes. She put the surface volumes through a persistent homology measurement tool that she engineered and then used linear discriminant analysis to group these persistent homology measurements based on their characteristics. And what turned out was this LDA grouping of all the phenotypes, all the different 3D measurements of the grape rachises, corresponded very nicely to the actual genotypes. And it mapped very, very well. So the very broad range of shapes actually linked very nicely to the differences in the genotype. So Mao was really the, the spearhead of the analysis side of that. Again, I had the easy part. I just kept putting rachises in and scanning them and getting these wonderful data back from Mao showing what we were learning from it. Uh, but the other thing we wanted to learn was, you know, can we use this in a predictive sense? Can we scan actual grape bunches and start to incorporate the size of the berry and the distribution of the berries along the grape rachis to start to come up with modeling rules for how does bunch of grapes form? What are the rules that govern the shape? Does it stop at a certain point? Does it stop when it contacts? Does it stop at a certain weight? And these are some of the, the, the measurement data that went into this paper that 
that Mao again wrote, and, and Jason was part of, I was a part of Dan Chitwood, a number of folks who really contributed to understanding more about the how these, these objects occupy 3D space. Um, and so again, this is just an animation that Mao put together that, that illustrates using these rules, how berries might grow and how they form, but it begins with mapping the rachis itself and then adding the modeling component that we got from the berries. Sorghum panicles, sorghum is a very important crop for food security in many areas of the world. It grows often in places where corn does not. Um, from the image here, you can see that it's tremendous variability in panicle architecture. Uh, when I started at the Danforth, there were a few scientists who had collections of hundreds and hundreds of, of different panicles from an association mm -hmm. panel. And so we realized that, that an X-ray scan of an entire panicle would give us a really data-rich uh, information to work with. So not only could we see every individual grain, but then we could also see the underlying architecture of, of the panicle itself, all the branches that hold on to the grains. So again, if you're breeding sorghum and you want more grains, you need to understand what the impact is on the supporting architecture. And again, we're very fortunate to work with very talented postdocs. Um, Mao, again, was part of this, but Ray Shao, who's now uh, a scientist at Wageningen in the Netherlands, um, they took all the data. We scanned over 900 sorghum panicles. And what they were able to do was to use the scan data to, as you can see from this graph, graph map where along the panicle the most grains were deposited. Was it most in the middle, most at the ends? And how did that vary across the 900 in the population? Zoom in and actually analyze the shape of every individual grain. How round were they? How spherical? How ellipsoid? And how was that shape range distributed across the 900 grain, uh, varieties? And then electronically remove every single grain, not by hand, but electronically, and then leave behind the branching architecture and map that. So now these are all mappable, measurable 3D trait data, phenotype data that can be compared using multivariate statistics amongst all these 900 different varieties. And what they found that the conventional wisdom was the shape of the panicle dictated the genetics. And in fact, that was not the case. You could find the same examples of panicle architecture across all the genotypes. So that was not the measure of interest. And again, working with, with all stars like Toby Kellogg uh, in the field of grass and grass biology is just one of the benefits of being at the Danforth, surrounded by just really phenomenal people that raise your game. Far more important than that is a distillery located in downtown St. Louis, where a friend of mine, Dave Wegler, makes a really spectacular sorghum whiskey. So if you ever get to St. Louis, you have to go to this distillery. It's just four blocks from Bush Stadium if you go to the ball game. Uh, and, and he'd love to give you samples of the sorghum whiskey. And you can see off to the side uh, some of the sorghum panicles. So always some practical input from, from the imaging that we're doing. Again, I told you the top lab started out looking at uh, corn roots and corn root biology. So how does one actually measure and phenotype maize roots when obviously everything important is happening below ground? So we've been breeding plants as humans for thousands of years, but only breeding what we can see and improve. And along with that came root traits. They are there, they vary but we've not been able to work with them very efficiently. So when you look at these uh, 15 different maize root crowns, it's a very informative region, right where the roots come together, the nexus, right at the soil line. They were all grown in the greenhouse in an artificial medium in great big tree pots. So the environmental conditions were as identical as we can practically make them. So you see the huge variety evident. Clearly the genes are playing a big role in making roots decide how to occupy 3D space. We want to get a handle on those genes. We want to find a good strategy for doing that. So for us, it begins with measurement. So we'll plant breeding populations out in our research fields. And then the whole lab goes out there with shovels and lots of coolers of water and, and, and all sorts of bribes. And it's literally shovelomics. So a shovel will dig up a useful volume right around that root crown. And then they all get brought back to the lab. They get washed. We have washing stations and dried. And that gives us really a very rich data source 
that describes 3D architecture because the maze root crowds are relatively well lignified at this stage. They hold their shape pretty well. So comparisons between genotypes are, are valid. So what we can do is a very rapid three minute scan because we're not so interested in the internal details, but it gives us a great model of the 3D shape. And that's what we're interested in. How can we get 3D trait information about how roots occupy 3D space? And again, I get the easy part, I get the fun part, I get to scan stuff and then dump terabytes of data on our poor computational scientists who have to pull information back out. And what they've been able to do is generate a number of trait extraction pipelines. These are computational pipelines. The first one looks at overall, how does that root crown occupy 3D space? So Ni nee and Mao and Tim and, and Ray develop this, this computational pipeline, which in stages takes a 3D volume and then binarizes it, skeletonizes it, and then allows it to use the geometry tools available in many software packages to map how this complicated structure occupies 3D space. And any difference we see there, we can assume relatively equivalent environmental conditions. We can start to have measurements that differ across phenotypes. The more measurement differences we have in phenotypes, let's compare that to the actual DNA sequences where we can obviously see differences, but we don't know which are the important ones. To what degree can we use multivariate statistics to map the measured phenotypic differences onto the observed sequence differences and start to zoom in on potential genes that control root architecture? Um, we worked with colleagues at Washington University in the computer science program, uh, Tao Zhu's lab, and uh, this was Dan's uh, PhD work to develop topo root, which is a different type of pipeline that starts with the same data, but now starts to look at individual high, uh, high fidelity root traits. How are they branching? Where are they branching? How many branches? And so we have sort of different scales of these pipelines to pull as much 3D trait information out the other end uh, as we can. It is possible to do live plant imaging. Again, we have the large industrial scale instrument and Alex actually got his undergraduate degree here at Cornell. He's a PhD student in the lab. He's got a really interesting mutant that is um, altered in its ability to make nodal roots. So we want to see where do nodal roots form or don't form. If they don't form, did they never even start or did they start in a board? What's the fate? What's controlling? What's the morphology of that? So we can actually do in vivo x-ray imaging because these are relatively non-dense tissues so that's a living corn plant this is actually we did this last week we're looking at that region right at the soil line because alex is interested in nodal root formation right in those first few nodes right in under the soil and then the first node above the soil so that's live imaging the scan was just seven minutes long relatively low energy but what it gives us is such incredibly rich detailed 3d information that Alex this week is looking at TIFF stacks that go through all this. And so he has high resolution data through this entire complicated region, which will now be pretty straightforward for him to evaluate how many and where nodal roots are or are not between the wild type and the mutant. So this is uh, an example of what we're doing immediately. And, and we were fortunate enough to put together a, a book chapter specifically on phenotyping using this large format uh, X-ray tomography instrument. But of course, we're a root lab. We want to know what's going on underground. But short of a tornado, it's difficult to just sort of peel back what's going on to look directly at what's happening without fundamentally changing exactly what it is we want to measure. So we're devising systems to do in situ imaging of roots. Uh, and this is what one of those setups look like. It's, it's foam core PVC. It's relatively non-dense, not the heavy stuff for, for construction but much more lighter weight for, for food and water transport. And we use a variety of diameters. Um, but when you look through it, this is an example of a live image. This isn't live, but it's, it's a, a single 2D shot of a radiograph. And it's really hard to see anything in this kind of view. So we'll take, again, thousands of images through the entire volume and then use computer reconstruction to rebuild the volume. So this is a fly through looking from top to bottom. 
And with our eyes, it's relatively easy to spot the roots, certainly the primary roots and the secondaries, but trying to find the laterals, it starts to get more difficult. And that's always going to be the problem is resolution. And I'll get to that shortly, but what this allows us to do, if I can see the roots, then there is software out there that allows me to iteratively teach a computer how to find and identify the roots, how to identify the soil, how to identify the air, how to identify the sides of the pot, because I want everything removed except the roots. Because if we can do that, now we have effectively a root crown. We have existing pipelines. We can put that root crown in situ scan through that pipeline and start to pull out 3D root traits. So that is the biggest hurdle that anyone in tomography has is segmentation. How do you teach a computer to only measure what you want to see and discount everything else? We're getting there. I did this particular segmentation, but utterly impractically, it took me about three weeks for one volume. Um, part of that is the scan size. This is about 45 gigabytes. Because you need all that information, the more information, the better you can train the model, but the slower it goes. So if you downsize, you now lose the resolution that you need to train a model. It's, it's a horrible trade-off. So one of the most frequently asked questions I ever get is, what resolution can be achieved? Well, on the left, on one side is a big pumpkin that's very large. On the right is an acorn, much, much smaller. Uh, the answer, of course, is it depends. The bigger your sample, the lower the resolution. That's true for all imaging and microscopy. Uh, but specifically, if we're talking about in situ root imaging, the bigger the pot, the more dense the material, the lower the resolution. So effectively, what we're going to do is choose different pots based on the biology we want. If we just want to see where primary roots go, we'll use a big pot. We'll never see laterals. To see laterals, we have to use a much smaller diameter. But that is as unusual as possible because the roots immediately hit the sides and they bundle up. And, and so you have to take a variety pack way of approaching different questions. So resolution inver uh, varies inversely with pot diameter. Um, scan time increases with higher resolution. Like I said, you can increase the number of projections, you get better resolution, but you get gigantic file sizes, at least 40 gigabytes per volume. And, and that's just a lot of heavy lifting. In addition to the massive problem that we have with data management, data storage, we've got hundreds of terabytes. Just, it, it's, we're actually, I think we're over a petabyte now just with the x-ray stuff. Um, and then what do you grow the plants in? Ideally, you want to use field soil, but that's really dense. So the more dense something is, the lower the resolution, because you have to blast more x-ray energy to get through. So you use various artificial media, which are less dense, but sort of departing from, from a natural field soil. So again, lots and lots of trade-offs. Resolution versus size versus time versus um, the growth medium. And ultimately, we want to get as much as possible. We've got this lovely Kieselbach volume, and the, the hand-drawn images are just spectacular. But again, we're getting a tiny glimpse, whether it's excavated root crowns or a little in situ pot that we grow for two or three weeks. It's a proxy for what's actually happening. So we're always dealing with trade-offs. So root imaging, we can get lots of useful information, and we keep sneaking up on what's actually happening in the field. But we'll never get there. There's never a physical system where you're going to be able to grow field-sized plants inside the cabinet of an x-ray chamber. It's simply, you simply can't. So we have to find as many proxies as possible to inform, um, inform what we're doing. The large format instrument does hit a resolution limit when you want to see very, very fine details. And this is exemplified by this um, soybean axillary bud system. So the live images on the, the, the Phone images on the left, it's about the size of a, a dime, maybe, but it's very complicated. It's a very complicated, uh, intricate structure, lots of different small things going on all in one small space. There is no microscope that will show you what that looks like in 3D if it's intact. Any light microscope, you'll have to slice it, squash it, make it small. Electron microscopy embedded in resin and cut little tiny blocks. You'll never get that intact structure. And that's where the X-ray microscope absolutely shines. So we have, this is what the inside of the system looks like. 
Uh, again, Valent and their parent company, Sumitomo Chemical, were very interested in mycorrhizal fungi, root soil microbe interactions, as well as carbon sequestration. So they've been uh, generous supporters of the lab, uh, in addition to the Danforth Center itself, funding a third of, of this instrument. And in fact, you can see uh, by, by the labels that there are actually objective lenses that you swing into the beam path in order to magnify some of the imaging. So it, it's important to compare um, how conventional X-ray tomography generates an image uh, with, with the X-ray microscope. So recall that conventional is just basic geometry of source, sample, detector. And varying those distances changes your magnification and your resolution. With the X-ray microscope, you still also have an X-ray source, which projects X-rays through a sample. But what that does is the X-rays strike a scintillator. The scintillator converts X-rays into light, and that's mounted on the front of an objective lens. So that's where you get the scintillator X-ray to light mounted on the lens, and that's how you generate the 3D image. It's unfortunately for the lab-based systems a relatively inefficient process, so the scan times take much, much longer. Again, always trade-offs, but what you're able to get out the other end is, uh, I never get tired of it. Every single day I come in, I get to see something that no one on the planet has seen before, and often it's just stunning. So if we look at this, um, uh, the soybean axial bud, typically it's fixed and contrast enhanced, so it's not typically live imaging, but the, with the large format instrument, this is about as good as you get. To look at it with the X-ray microscope, you just get a different universe of data. I've seen beautiful paintings and drawings of, of plant anatomy throughout my entire career, but it was not until I sat down at the workstation and saw my first soybean florette scan when I actually appreciated how the anthers are distributed in 3D space right around the stigmatic surface and how sensible that was. But you never get that in 3D, but here you do. Developing ovules there, pollen-packed anthers distributed right around the reproductive surface. It is, contra it is fixed and contrast enhanced, so the only way you can do sort of developmental studies is if you fix them over developmental time. So time and relative dimension in space for any Doctor Who fans, TARDIS, um, is, is part of, of what we have to do to try to get developmental series using this, this uh, imaging technology. Um, <clears throat> I was talking to Margaret earlier about how striking some of the 3D volumes are. They're very impactful, but not necessarily scientifically useful, other than putting zooms in context of the whole organ. But what those 3D volumes represent is what we call a fly through. You're looking at an arbitrary dimension, slice by slice, and seeing every single angle through this very complicated structure in very high resolution rich detail. You can do cell level resolution in a 3D space using this kind of imaging. Again, it has to be fixed and contrast enhanced. And on the side, there are some pretty typical uh, contrast agents, which with my background in electron microscopy are routinely used. Phosphotungstic acid, iodine, osmium. Um, Yannick Stadler's lab in 2013 was the first one to publish any kind of survey using a, a lab-based x-ray microscope. And they looked at a few different plant samples, and we use that as a jumping off point to really expand what they first introduced and really explore a wider range of, of plant samples and improved instrument technology. So Yonix Lab was the one who started it, and we sort of benefited from their pioneering work to really branch out into, into other things. Um, it's also very important, um, I was telling Lynn earlier that I went to a botanical microscopy conference where everybody there was a plant scientist and an imaging specialist, so a pretty rare group. All of them knew who I was. They'd seen the papers. In fact, we recognized each other on the plane over. This is at, at the John Innes Center. They knew what was going on. They read the paper, but they still didn't get it until I actually stood in front of them like this and showed them the animations and showed them how a sample gets presented to the instrument before they could realize what was possible. So I wanna really spend some time showing you how samples are prepared and how they're presented to the instrument so you understand the tremendous value of the imaging data that comes out the other end. So around the Danforth Center, we do not have a corporate lawn. We have an authentic Missouri prairie, which is fantastic. 
although the neighbors complained that when are you going to cut your lawn they just didn't get it um, now it's beautiful wildflowers and it's much more mature but we have asclepias we have milkweed everywhere so it was a great example to illustrate the the step-by-step -step process so if you want to look at something again this is about the size of a you'd cover that with a nickel large complicated flower that goes into in this case uh an ethanolic solution of phosphotungstic acid. The ethanol gets past all the hydrophobicity of a plant sample and penetrates very, very well, although it takes weeks. This is minimum of about 21 days for the phosphotungstic acid to penetrate and to contrast well. And then how do you present this really delicate, flimsy tissue paper-like thing to a microscope for 12 hours and not have it move around? Low melting point agarose. In all of our labs, we have plastic tubes of a wide range of sizes. So you pick the tube that fits it best, fill it with molten agarose, drop in your sample after a quick rinse, and it holds that delicate, complicated structure in place for a long imaging scan. And what you're able to do is generate, again, very, very rich 3D volumes where you can do multi-scale imaging without leaving the sample. So low magnification scan of the whole thing, identify a region of interest, and then zoom in for a higher resolution scan, never having touched the sample. You just leave it in the instrument and let the computer do the work. Um, again, the 3D volume rendering has a great impact for, for getting people to remember what we're able to do to illustrate the multi-scale imaging, putting a high mag region of interest within the context of the whole thing. But much more impactful is the fly-through. You get that cell level resolution of the entire structure, but totally shocking to me, the beautiful symmetry of the sample itself. Just looking, I get mesmerized watching this movie, and, and it just makes me think of spirographs growing up. So a lot of the, the, the volumes I'm going to show you will have the 3D volume rendering followed by the fly-through to, to impress upon you how data-rich these volumes are. Um, this is from a, a paper we published in 22 um looking at uh nodule formation these are our soybean nodules formed by um brady rhizobium and again the multi-scale nature we can zoom in on individual bacteroids and then put that zoom scan within the context of the whole nodule where all the bacteroids and the vasculature are really really easy to visualize and again with a competent computational scientist you can identify all these features once they're computationally identified, you can measure them and start to then compare these measurements between nodules, between time points, between varieties. You now have measurements to go along with these, with these phenotypes. And Gus did a great job um, segmenting this. Um, some of the other ranges of studies we look at, again, the, the Danforth Center is very um, well positioned to look at food security crops, and TEF is one of them. It's very popular in Eastern Africa great salt tolerance great for drought lousy agronomic traits a very willowy stalk and shattering is very very bad the seeds quite understandably want to disperse as easily as possible but that's lousy if you want to actually collect the seeds for harvest so shattering is a trait we wanted to get rid of so the seed would stay put so the growers could harvest and shattering is a trait that we studied here again in 3d uh, in ways with intact samples that you can't do just by embedding and sectioning. Um, Lucia was a postdoc in Malia Gann's lab. She's now across the street at Bayer. She's got a great job there, but she developed some mutants in quinoa that showed some very good heat tolerance. And it's the inflorescence structures and the pollination timing, which is often most bad, negatively affected by, by heat stress. So what we want to be able to do is first map out in 3D, what does normal look like the normal complicated inflorescence structure and then if you blast it with heat how does that change the structure and then if you have a heat tolerant mutant how does it survive that all to inform what heat tolerance genes can we get our hands on how can we improve all these different plant varieties by identifying the genes that that are most important and again the 2d fly throughs just provides so much rich detailed information you can measure things now you can answer questions using these data you couldn't even ask before doing this kind of work so it's really really powerful um will uh will viana is got some great satere mutants he works in in jose denini's lab at stanford 
and they have some mutants that are altered in their ability to make uh, root primordia in Ceteria. So what we're able to do is scan the entire nodal plexus, that really important junction at the soil line where all the vasculature is coming together, and look for the origin or not of, of root primordia. Again, a 3D volume is great for context, but the power comes from the 2D slices. What they're going to be able to do is segment every single cell, measure and map every single cell in the wild type and the mutant, and compare all those measurements. That is just a, a priceless way to get at phenotypic information where you can link to sequence variation. Uh, the top lab is getting into more cover crop biology because of its, its potential for aiding soil health. And of course, cover crops make beautiful nodules, great for nitrogen management. To what degree can we use multi-scale X-ray microscopy imaging to inform nodule development? Um, again, situating the high magnification scan within the, the full 3D volume is cool, but the data, the real information comes from these 2D slices. Uh, this is plant biology. I'm not allowed to get away without showing something Arabidopsis related. So these are developing Arabidopsis seeds inside a silic. Um, again, just to illustrate the, the unique data that is available using this kind of imaging technology. This is from Margaret. This is one of her samples that she left with me before she left the Danforth Center. This is a two week old tomato seedling. Um, it's a fly through, but again, what it's telling you is if you're interested in graft biology and graft, whether it will take or not, graft compatibility, this will give you a roadmap of the vasculature if you have a competent computational scientist to map all the vasculature. But this is something you have available now. Ceteria, shoot apical meristem, again, now just examples all the different kinds of biological tissue in 3D that we have access to. Young Arabidopsis seedlings, you want to do phenotyping of an entire structure. This is available. Um, developing Ceteria panicles. Um, anything that used to be 3D with, or used, used to be with scanning electron microscopy, where you just get a 2D photograph of a really cool 3D structure, you now have a full 3D map inside, outside, upside, and down. Any angle you want to go through, you have the 3D information. Uh, again, important to sort of remind you and point out the different ways in which samples are presented to the microscope. It helps to understand what the geometry is to see how will it or perhaps won't it apply to the kinds of questions I want to ask. You wouldn't put an ear of corn in there as such, but certainly a kernel. It does have the capacity for large things, and I'll show you that later, but there's a range of things that we can put in here. So this was uh, a soybean root nodule. It's, it's suspended in agarose. Uh, we looked at uh, pennycress is a very popular cover crop these days. We're working on uh, with a company called Covercress at the Danforth Center to breed pennycress to take advantage of the agronomic traits. And these are dry seeds. They're just sort of wedged in the end of a pipette tip with poster putty. <laughs> All sorts of creative ways just to present your samples to the x-ray beam. And of course, resin embedded, uh, resin embedded plant tissue is, is going to be a mainstay of what we do, certainly for volume EM. Uh, we do have a flat panel in the instrument. We can do in vivo root imaging. So again, we grow plants in these PVC pipes. This flat panel will allow us to map the entire root structure at high resolution, in this case, 26 micrometer voxel resolution. You'll definitely get laterals with that. And then if you find a region of interest, swap in one of the objective lenses and look at high resolution, high mag at a region of interest. Uh, we're hoping to use this system now to adapt to looking at mycorrhizal fungi in these larger systems. And I'll show some of the earlier work we did with that uh, shortly. Um, I'm often asked about phase contrast imaging, certainly from the synchrotron folks, because phase can be very powerful at a synchrotron when you're dealing with samples of low, uh, low density and low differential density. We do have the capacity to do phase contrast imaging in our system, but we take a big hit in resolution. Um, and Zeiss does develop, uh, they've developed some AI tools to help sort of clean up the noise that is expected. But still, this was a sample, this was a, a soybean flower that was only fixed in ethanol then immediately imaged, no contrast agent. So it's possible to do imaging, but clearly you take a big hit in what you can see relative to, con uh, to contrast enhanced material. 
a lot of my goal is to get more people to think about and to take advantage of, of this technology. And this is actually a white paper that's, that's free to download. You can go to the Zeiss website and download this. Uh, it tells a lot of the nuts and bolts of the methods and the sample development for doing x-ray microscopy specifically for plant samples. Because many plant scientists have access to core facilities, but don't know how to present the sample to it. Core facilities have x-ray microscopes. They've never worked with plant samples. I'm hoping that the publications that we have will, will bring a lot of that together and really expand what everyone is in a position to do um, with, with x-ray imaging. A little over a year ago, Nature came out with technologies to watch in 2023 and volume EM, volume electron microscopy is one of them. And that is using various um, electron microscopes where one can do physical sectioning in order to generate a 3D volume at the nanometer scale. So there's serial block face scanning electron microscopes where you have an actual physical microtome inside the instrument. So you'll take a diamond knife, you'll cut one section, image, cut, image, and get maybe hundreds. And you can get down to about 50, 60 nanometer in, in section thickness. The other alternative is, is a plasma uh, focused ion beam where you can actually use a laser to ablate the surface, image, ablate, image, and you can get down to about five or 10 nanometer section thickness. So you can generate a beautiful 3D volume at the organeller scale. And so volume EM is something we want to use as a roadmap to drive volume EM. So what that looks like, here's a sample of actually a tobacco leaf disc embedded in resin, mounted in the x-ray microscope. And we'll do a scan of the entire leaf disc to get a roadmap. And then you bring in some of the world's leading plant tissue specific imaging folks. This is Kirk Zimmick. He was a postdoc in the lab. I was at at DuPont. He's now the director of the imaging facility at the Danforth Center. And it's never just the instruments. He's got some of the most talented microscopists in the world working with some of the best instruments on the planet. So you bring expertise and instrumentation together and, and what you can do is astounding. So uh, Nastia, Janithri, and Lolita are just are brilliant. So we're able to do some marvelous things um, so this is a fly through of the low magnification x-ray scan through the tobacco leaf disc. And what Kirk and his team did was take my 3D scan and identify in green this region of interest. And so we worked together. I took the sample back and then did a much higher magnification scan of that region of interest. Take the data, hand it back over to them, and they use it as a roadmap. And they want to look at just these mesophyll sections of mesophyll cells indicated by the yellow box here. And so that went actually to the, um, the SEM, which had a backscatter electron detector, which you can actually use to invert the black and white, and it looks like a TEM. That region of interest, and then using their technology, they zoom in on features that they want to look at, like the purple box there. And with serial block face imaging, they went zooming through this region. And I think they collected about 250 or 300 uh, sections, each as it indicates 50 nanometers thick. And again, you have a 3D volume at very, very high nanometer scale resolution. So again, computational science is everything. A good computational scientist now can identify and measure individual features so that you can see and measure distribution in 3D space, total volume, amount, different changes. Uh, everything is now measurable and accessible. Again, the publication is out there. The information is out there. Please, please look into it as something that you might want to take advantage of. Um, it is there. Uh, I promised some specific work on what we're doing with mycorrhizal fungi. Um, most of you, I'm sure, understand that mycorrhizal fungi form beneficial interactions with most plant roots in the, in, in the world. They exchange nutrients and water with the plant for photosynthet photosynthetic sugars, beneficial relationship for both. From an imaging standpoint, we're interested in the purple bits, all the fungal structures that are out in the soil that colonize the root and then start this nutrient exchange. There has been some genuinely spectacular scientific research looking at the genes that play roles 
in governing these relationships, the, the, the exchange of carbon, who's benefiting, who's cheating, who's holding up their end of the bargain. There's some really fantastic work that's been done all in vitro. Uh, there's been some great imaging work. Jen Magali's at, uh, she's finishing her PhD at Cambridge and she designed this beautiful microscope slide where the plant grows on the edge and you can train a single root that comes out between two glass slides. Very elegant, you can do great imaging work uh, and in real time do dynamic imaging work with a lot of the, the fluorescent tools available, but it's always in vitro. This is a difficult system to look at to understand how these things are naturally distributed in as sort of natural a system as you can energy, uh, uh, engineer. The hyphae are transparent. They're difficult to see. These are a, a pack of hyphae just stuck in agarose at the bottom of a tube. So how do we make these transparent structures contrasty enough to see with, with the electron microscope, with, with the X-ray microscope? And so we, I, we look back at our experience with using, uh, micro, using electron microscopy and making things contrasty. So osmium is, is, is clearly something that, although challenging to work with, is very, very effective at making transparent things contrasty. So with our in vitro carrot root culture, we were able to very clearly show that, that the fungal structures, both inside and outside the roots, were very well contrasted. So we applied that to what we're calling a microcosm. We can grow alfalfa or brachypodium in small 20 mil syringe barrels. Roots will be colonized. Uh, fungal structures will grow out into the surrounding medium and we can contrast them and image them. So what you're seeing here in orange is uh, fungal spores and vesicles, both inside and outside the root in the surrounding growth medium, as well as intra radical hyphae and extra radical hyphae. So we've demonstrated this can be done. Um, I'm gonna speed up a little bit just to make sure we get through in time for questions. Um, again, at the Danforth Center, we're surrounded by some fantastic scientists and Armando's got great experience in mycorrhizal biology. So he's developed the brachypodium system along with his, with his senior tech, uh, Millette. And so we're using that to look at colonization, again, in these microcosms, how the, the better the imaging, the more successful we can actually train a computer model to identify the features we want to see. So everything in yellow here is both internal spores as well as vesicles inside a root. We can quantify the amount of fungus that's inside a colonized root in situ. So now this opens up some, some really huge avenues to start exploring basic biology. To what degree can we quantify fungal biomass in a given genotypic interaction, a particular maize genotype, a particular brachypodium genotype? How does that normal change with less phosphorus, more phosphorus, more nitrogen? How can we change the environment and alter these measurable traits? Um, we're also exploring other things in addition to uh, osmium to see can we get away from a, a heavy, volatile, toxic, heavy metal as something to, to visualize fungal structures. So we're looking at, at nano gold conjugates. We can always conjugate things to, to fungal structures. Can we stick enough gold particles on it to be able to see with the X-ray microscope? And of course, we're prepping um, a, a methods manuscript. Uh, I'm gonna wrap up with, with a switch from the plant, the roots and the fungi to actually the medium within which, within which they're growing. And that's the soil. With the two instruments, we can do a lot of multi-scale imaging. So we can use the X-ray microscope to look at the microbial scale. We can look at soil aggregates. And, and again, I was telling Lynn, you know, we're constantly learning new techniques and new fields. Um, I've had to learn soil uh, physics over the past couple of years and soil science. So I've learned that the aggregate is essentially the lowest, the smallest currency of agricultural soil. If you took a shovel and scoop big agricultural soil and just shook it around, the smallest naturally occurring size of chunk that comes out is a soil aggregate. And the size and the stability of that aggregate tells you a lot about the soil health. So we can look at uh, the actual structure of soil aggregate with the x-ray microscope. And then we can look at a soil core from the same area, put the context of the aggregate into the core and then the core into the field. So across scales, we can study a lot about the structure 
of, of actual agricultural soil. We've got some great collaborators at K-State. Uh, Chuck Rice's lab has been around for decades and Carlos uh, was spearheading this work as a PhD student. He's actually, he's just finished. Um, and then Cody, Mao, Sarah, and Clara uh, are the, the Danforth scientists who are working on this as well. And we're comparing it to what would be a gold standard, the Conza Prairie. It's about 3,500 hectares of undisturbed tall grass prairie in Eastern Kansas. And so what we wanna ask is what can we learn about the 3D structure of soil across scales? So Chuck's lab has been monitoring and managing some research fields for now over 34 consecutive years. They've been using no-till compared to conventional tillage. They've been using conventional chemical fertilizer uh, compared to using a high organic manure as a fertilizer. So they collected soil cores and soil aggregates and sent them to us for imaging from all these different treatments. So this is a typical soil core inside the large format x-ray instrument and, and a typical image of what you'll see. Uh, we subsampled the middle to avoid some of the cracking artifacts on the side because we want to measure pore space. Those cracks are obviously going to, to bias things. Um, and so what we're doing, and this is work in progress, um, we're using these very high resolution 3D scans of a core to map out pore space. Can we differentiate between pore space and soil organic matter? Mostly the answer is no. And this was always shocking to me. I've gone to soil science meetings where everyone's saying, here's all the pore space and here's all the soil organic material. They've never seen the x-ray scans where the overlap is way too much to actually differentiate the two. So they're losing a great deal. So we're, we've turned Mao Lee loose on this problem. So if anyone can solve it, she can. But we're trying to map out what are the differences that we can observe structurally between the different field management practices. And then drop down to a smaller scale, look at an entire soil aggregate. Again, map out the pore space, map out the organic material, and look at that over scale. To what degree does the pore space map in the aggregate compare or not to the equivalent treatment, but at a larger scale in a soil core? Is one predictive of the other? What can we learn across scales? Um, we've embedded some of the aggregates in resin, and we'd like to, we've sent some samples off from X ray fluorescence, and ideally, maybe work with a synchrotron to do some, some zanes to look at very subtle differences and, and elemental mapping. Uh, but then also we could use these for, for volume electron microscopy. And again, that's, so that's what some of this is. The work is ongoing. We wanna compare soil pore networks across these treatments. Uh, we have an elementar um, mass spec system in the lab so we can look at and measure absolute amount of carbon, absolute amount of nitrogen. Uh, and, and Cody's really the one heading up um, this manuscript. And that was, I could, Lynn knows I could talk for hours, but I won't. I will spare you and I will stop here and happily take any questions. So we're checking the chat to see if there are um, questions from online. Otherwise we'll look here in the room. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was just wondering if this would allow you to see at a cellular level or is it more structured? So the question is, um, can we get to the cellular level? And the answer is yes. Typically, the samples have to be smaller, but for example, this Ceteria uh, nodal plexus, that sample was maybe three millimeters tall by a millimeter in diameter, easily achieving cellular resolution there. With the soybean uh, developing flowers, you can see the entire structure, but then we could zoom in onto the developing ovules. We could see synergids, we could see polar nuclei, so it is possible to see at the cellular level in that regard, a lot of them, a lot of these cells in the plants are actually quite large. Um, so a lot of the stalk segments, a lot of the grafting stuff, um, a lot of the inflorescence development, there's a lot of complicated material there, but it's relatively large. So we can achieve cellular level resolution there. Um, the root nodules were another one. Um, but at the same time, keep in mind that this is just a microscope. The most powerful lens we have is just 40x. And even your tabletop microscope, you multiply that by 10 times from the ocular lens. We just have a 40x lens. So you will never see a bacterial cell. You will see a bacteroid, which is essentially a plant host cell that's been sort of taken over. You will not see a bacterial cell. We can see AMF spores if they're contrasted. Um, it's difficult to differentiate the hyphae if they're there, unless they've got a ton of osmium on them. So that's sort of the, the, the fade out range. 
how, how rapidly, how rapidly um, can you screen the little tubes with the brachyphonium mycorrhizal uh, fungi that were in there? Is that, does that take a long time to do that scan? Yeah, so the question is about the, the microcosms looking at brachypodium um, and, and also uh, alfalfa. How quickly can we scan those? So what I'll end up doing is I can do a relatively short scan, which is three to four hours, but that shows me the entire microcosm low resolution, but enough for me to see the bright spots of fungal material. And then I'll set up a, a higher magnification scan. That will be 10 to 12 hours at least. So those scans are quite long. It's not good for high throughput or even medium throughput, but it is genuinely unique in being able to see the distribution of mycorrhizal structures in 3D in an undisturbed in situ rig. It's not the field, but no one else is in a position to do this kind of, of 3D in situ imaging. And are you flooding that whole um, syringe with osmium? Yes, and we're also taking advantage of the fact that osmium has a great uh, vapor potential. So you can use osmium vapors to also contrast material. But the other benefit of that syringe barrel system is it's got a lure lock. And so I can lock that. I can parafilm the crap out of these things and make sure that it's very, very well contained. Um, what I am doing right now is I've got some, some microcondoms that I've flooded with uh, ethanolic phosphotungstic acid. I had done in vitro, that's beautiful. You can see individual arbuscules. It's fantastic, but it takes weeks and weeks. So I've set these up. It is absolutely flooded. There's, there's a meniscus on the top. I mean, it is absolutely flooded in ethanolic phosphotungstic acid. I'm going to look at it in a couple months from now. Because if I can get away from osmium, I definitely want to. But short of not being able to image at all, um, the other step is going to be, as I mentioned, using um, gold conjugates, so nano gold. So lectins are very good in vitro at sticking to mycorrhizal fungi. And in vitro, we've shown that we can stick enough uh, wheat germagglutinin conjugated to gold nanoparticles so that we can see in vitro. I don't know if it's going to be enough to see in situ. It's just a bigger system and much more dense. Come Question online. So I know you said there are resolution image issues with the large scale X-ray tomography. What is the cutoff? Does this extend to fine roots? And that's that's again, it's a great question. So we can engineer the pot to be able to see the biology of interest that we're interested in. So if we want to see lateral roots, we'll grow something in nothing bigger than say four or five centimeter diameter pot. And we might just even get away from using field soil. We use um, ground up clay like profile or turfus. These are commercially available artificial growth media. We will be able to see lateral roots in, in, in that example. If we look at a larger pot, we will never see lateral roots. So we can adjust pot size and growth medium to allow the instrument to show us what's possible. There is an over excuse me, there's an overlap between the large format instrument and the X-ray microscope. Both have a flat panel option. So you saw one of the images in here where I had a small corn plant in the X-ray microscope. That panel is higher resolution than the one in the large format instrument. So even in that same three centimeter diameter PVC pipe, we'll get better resolution in the X-ray microscope. It's a longer scan and it's 60 to 70 gigabytes. Again, always the trade-off. If you want to see small roots in a big thing, it's going to cost you. But it is possible. Margaret. Um, I was just thinking about your, your last part on field soil composition and your early work on root architecture and the plasticity of roots. Are you like thinking about a system where you can start looking at how the heterogeneity of real soil systems is influencing that plasticity or is that yes absolutely um, and I, I was hoping to get the chance to say that we're working on a topsoil in chris top's lab um, we're working on an authentic field soil that is reproducible that we can use all the time because up till now we've only used the artificial media because that has been less daunting for segmentation field soil is so much more like a root itself it's just diff more difficult to teach the computer to find the roots. But that is our goal this year especially, is to demonstrate that in a number of diameters, we can grow two different maize genotypes where we know the root structure is different. The root architecture is going to be different. Can we 
get good enough at segmentation where we can pull out those 3D volumes. Now they're root 3D volumes with nothing around them and plug them into our trait extraction pipelines and actually see that the trait differences we can see by eye, we can also measure from the in-situ x-ray scans. So we need to demonstrate that we can do that. And then we can then step forward through all the different bio basic biology questions from genotype to environment. One last question. One last question. Yes. Uh, is there any work being done to build functional plant models, things like that, uh, using especially like architecture data? Yes, there are computational scientists and modeling scientists who are taking some of these data and, and sort of developing it into different questions. These are collaborators we have at, at St. Louis University, as well as uh, Washington University, both in downtown St. Louis. So they are in computer science programs, and very often they are starved for data sets. We've got hundreds of terabytes of data sets. Please do as much as you can with these. And a lot of that is modeling. Um, Tao Zhu's lab really developed, and this was, again, Dan Zhang did a great job developing a skeletonization protocol that sort of got around the problem of loops where things would loop back against one another and you would the computer would lose it. And so they've been able to convert that 2D into 3D where you could actually track these, these looping structures. So yeah, a lot of that work is being done. We've got great colleagues who are following that up. Thank you. All right. That, Thank you, go. everyone. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.